The Story of Fire Once upon a time a man was contemplating the ways in which nature operates, and he discovered because of his concentration and application how fire could be made. This man was called Nur. He decided to travel from one community to another, showing people his discovery. Nur passed the secret to many groups of people. Some took advantage of the knowledge. Others drove him away, thinking that he must be dangerous, before they had had time to understand how valuable this discovery could be to them. Finally, a tribe before which he demonstrated became so panic-stricken that they set about him and killed him, being convinced that he was a demon. Centuries passed. The first tribe, which had learned about fire, reserved the secret for their priests, who remained in affluence and power while the people froze. The second tribe forgot the art and worshipped instead the instruments. The third worshipped a likeness of Nur himself, because it was he who had taught them. The fourth retained the story of the making of fire in their legends. Some believed them, some did not. The fifth community really did use fire, and this enabled them to be warmed, to cook their food, and to manufacture all kinds of useful articles. After many, many years, a wise man and a small band of his disciples were traveling through the lands of these tribes. The disciples were amazed at the variety of rituals which they encountered, and one and all said to the teacher, but all these procedures are in fact related to the making of fire, nothing else. We should reform these people. The teacher said, Very well then, we shall restart our journey. By the end of it, those who survive will know the real problems and how to approach them. When they reached the first tribe, the band was hospitably received. The priests invited the travelers to attend their religious ceremony, the making of fire. When it was over, and the tribe was in a state of excitement at the event which they had witnessed, the master said, Does anyone wish to speak? The first disciple said, In the cause of truth, I feel myself constrained to say something to these people. If you will do so at your own risk, you may do so, said the master. Now the disciples stepped forward in the presence of the tribal chief and his priests and said, I can perform the miracle which you take to be a special manifestation of deity. If I do, will you accept that you have been in error for so many years? But the priest cried, Seize him! And the man was taken away, never to be seen again. The travelers went to the next territory, where the second tribe were worshipping the instruments of fire-making. Again a disciple volunteered to try to bring reason to the community. With the permission of the master, he said, I beg permission to speak to you as reasonable people. You are worshipping the means whereby something may be done, not even the thing itself. Thus you are suspending the advent of its usefulness. I know the reality which lies at the basis of this ceremony. This tribe was composed of more reasonable people, but they said to the disciple, You are welcome as a traveler and stranger in our midst, but as a stranger, foreign to our history and customs, you cannot understand what we are doing. You make a mistake. Perhaps even you are trying to take away or alter our religion. We therefore decline to listen to you. The travelers moved on. When they arrived in the land of the third tribe, they found before every dwelling an idol representing Nur, the original fire-maker. The third disciple addressed the chiefs of the tribe. This idol represents a man who represents a capacity which can be used. This may be so, answered the Nur worshippers but the penetration of the real secret is only for the few. It is only for the few who will understand, not for those who refuse to face certain facts, said the third disciple. 
This is rank heresy, and from a man who does not even speak our language correctly, and is not a priest ordained in our faith, muttered the priests, and he could make no headway. The band continued their journey, and arrived in the land of the fourth tribe. Now a fourth disciple stepped forward in the assembly of the people. The story of making fire is true, and I know how it may be done, he said. Confusion broke out within the tribe, which split into various factions. Some said, this may be true, and if it is, we want to find out how to make fire. When these people were examined by the master and his followers, however, it was found that most of them were anxious to use fire-making for personal advantage and did not realize that it was something for human progress. So deep had the distorted legends penetrated into the minds of most people that those who thought that they might in fact represent truth were often unbalanced ones who could not have made fire even if they had been shown how. There was another faction who said, of course the legends are not true. This man is just trying to fool us, to make a place for himself here. And a further faction said, We prefer the legends as they are, for they are the very mortar of our cohesion. If we abandon them, and we find that this new interpretation is useless, what will become of our community then? And there were other points of view as well. So the party traveled on until they reached the lands of the fifth community, where fire-making was a commonplace, and where other preoccupations faced them. The master said to his disciples, You have to learn how to teach, for man does not want to be taught. First of all, you will have to teach people how to learn, and before that you have to teach them that there is still something to be learned. They imagine that they are ready to learn, but they want to learn what they imagine is to be learned, not what they have first to learn. When you have learned all this, then you can devise the way to teach. Knowledge without special capacity to teach is not the same as knowledge and capacity. The King's Son once, in a country where all men were like kings, there lived a family who were in every way content, and whose surroundings were such that the human tongue cannot describe them in terms of anything which is known to man today. This country of Shark seemed satisfactory to the young prince Dart, until one day his parents told him, Dearest son of ours, it is the necessary custom of our land for each royal prince, when he attains a certain age, to go forth on a trial. This is in order to fit himself for kingship, and so that both in repute and in fact he should have achieved, by watchfulness and effort, a degree of manliness not to be attained in any other way. Thus it has been ordained from the beginning, and thus it will be until the end. Prince Dat therefore prepared himself for his journey, and his family provided him with such sustenance they could, a special food which would nourish him during an exile, but which was of small compass, though of illimitable quantity. They also gave him certain other resources, which it is not possible to mention, to guard him if they were properly used. He had to travel to a certain country called Mizr, and he had to go in disguise. He was therefore given guides for the journey, and clothes befitting his new condition, clothes which scarcely resembled one royal born. His task was to bring back from Mizra a certain jewel, which was guarded by a fearsome monster. When his guides departed, Dart was alone, but before long he came across someone else who was on a similar mission and together they were able to keep alive the memory of their sublime origins. But, because of the air and the food of the country, a kind of sleep soon descended upon the pair, and Dat forgot his mission. For years 
He lived in Mizra, earning his keep and following a humble vocation, seemingly unaware of what he should be doing. By a means which was familiar to them, but unknown to other people, the inhabitants of Shark came to know of the dire situation of Dat, and they worked together in such a way as they could to help to release him and to enable him to persevere with his mission. A message was sent by a strange means to the princeling, saying, Awake, for you are the son of a king, sent on a special undertaking, and to us you must return. This message awoke the prince, who found his way to the monster, and, by the use of special sounds, caused it to fall into a sleep, and he seized the priceless gem which it had been guarding. Now Dat followed the sounds of the message which had woken him, changed his garb for that of his own land, and retraced his steps, guided by the sound, to the country of Shark. In a surprisingly short time, Dat again beheld his ancient robes and the country of his fathers, and reached his home. This time, however, through his experiences, he was able to see that it was somewhere of greater splendour than ever before, a safety to him. And he realised that it was the place commemorated vaguely by the people of Mizra as Salamat, which they took to be the word for submission, but which he now realised meant peace. The Gates of Paradise There was once a good man. He had spent his whole life in cultivating the qualities enjoined upon those who would reach paradise. He gave freely to the poor, he loved his fellow creatures, and he served them. Remembering the need to have patience, he endured great and unexpected hardships, often for the sake of others. He made journeys in search of knowledge, and his humility and exemplary behavior was such that his repute as a wise man and good citizen resounded from the east to the west and from the north to the south. All these qualities he did indeed exercise whenever he remembered to do so. But he had one shortcoming, and that was heedlessness. This tendency was not strong in him, and he considered that balanced against the other things which he did practice, it could only be regarded as a small fault. There were some poor friends whom he did not help, because from time to time he was insensitive to their needs. Love and service, too, were sometimes forgotten when what he thought to be personal needs, or at least desires, welled up in him. He was fond of sleep, and sometimes when he was asleep, opportunities to seek knowledge, or to understand it, or to practice real humility, or to add to the sum total of good behaviour, such opportunities passed by, and they did not return. Just as the good qualities left their impress upon his essential self, so did the characteristic of heedlessness. And then he died. Finding himself beyond this life, and making his way towards the doors of the walled garden, the man paused to examine his conscience. And he felt that his opportunity of entering the high portals was enough. The gates, he saw, were shut. And then a voice addressed him, saying, Be watchful, for the gates will open only once in every hundred years. He settled down to wait, excited at the prospect. But, deprived of chances to exercise virtues towards mankind, he found that his capacity of attention was not enough for him. After watching for what seemed like an age, his head nodded in sleep. For an instant his eyelids closed, and in that infinitesimal moment, the gates yawned open. Before his eyes were fully open again, they closed with a roar loud enough to wake the dead.
The Man Whose Time Was Wrong Once upon a time there was a rich merchant who lived in Baghdad. He had a substantial house, large and small properties, and dhows which sailed to the Indies with rich cargoes. He had gained these things partly through inheritance, partly through his own efforts, exercised at the right time and place, partly through the benevolent advice and direction of the King of the West, as the Sultan of Cordoba was called at that time. Then something went wrong. A cruel oppressor seized the land and houses. Ships which had gone to the Indies foundered in typhoons. Disaster struck his house and his family. Even his close friends seemed to have lost their power to be in true harmony with him, although both he and they wanted to have the right kind of social relationship. The merchant decided to journey to Spain to see his former patron, and he set off across the western desert. On the way, one accident after another overtook him. His donkey died. He was captured by bandits and sold into slavery, from which he escaped only with the greatest difficulty. His face was tanned by the sun until it was like leather. Rough villagers drove him away from their doors. Here and there, a dervish gave him a morsel of food and a rag to cover himself. Sometimes he was able to scoop a little fresh water from a pool, but more often than not it was brackish. Ultimately, he reached the entrance of the palace of the King of the West. Even here, he had the greatest difficulty in gaining entry. Soldiers pushed him away with the hafts of their spears. Chamberlains refused to talk to him. He was put to work as a minor employee at the court until he could earn enough to buy a dress suitable to wear when applying to the Master of Ceremonies for admission to the royal presence. But he remembered that he was near to the presence of the king, and the recollection of the Sultan's kindness to him long ago was still in his mind. Because, however, he had been so long in his state of poverty and distress, his manners had suffered, and the master of ceremonies decided that he would have to take a course in behaviour and self-discipline before he could allow him to be presented at court. All this the merchant endured, until, three years after he quit Baghdad, he was shown into the audience hall. The king recognised him at once, asked him how he was, and bade him sit in a place of honour beside him. "'Your Majesty,' said the merchant, "'I have suffered most terribly these past years. My lands were usurped, my patrimony expropriated, my ships were lost, and with them all my capital. For three years I have battled against hunger, bandits, the desert, people whose language I did not understand. Here I am to throw myself upon Your Majesty's mercy.' the king turned to the chamberlain. "'Give him a hundred sheep, make him a royal shepherd, send him up yonder mountain, and let him get on with his work.' Slightly subdued, because the king's generosity seemed less than he had hoped for, the merchant withdrew after the customary salutation. No sooner had he reached the scanty pasturage with his sheep than a plague struck them, and they all died he returned to the court. "'How are your sheep?' asked the king. "'Your Majesty, they died as soon as I got them to their pasture.' The king made a sign and decreed, "'Give this man fifty sheep, and let him tend them until further notice.' Feeling ashamed and distraught, the shepherd took the fifty animals to the mountainside, They started to nibble the grass well enough, but suddenly a couple of wild dogs appeared and chased them over a precipice, and they were all killed. The merchant, greatly sorrowing, returned to the king and told him his story. Very well, said the king, you may now take twenty-five sheep and continue as before. With almost no hope left in his heart, and feeling distraught beyond measure, because he did not feel himself to be a shepherd in any sense of the word, the merchant took his sheep to their pasture. As soon as he got them there, he found that the ewes all gave birth to twins, nearly doubling his flock. Then again 
twins were born. These new sheep were fat and well fleeced and made excellent eating. The merchant found that by selling some of the sheep and buying others, the ones which he bought, at first so skimpy and small, grew strong and healthy and resembled the amazing new breed which he was rearing. After three years, he was able to return to the court, splendidly attired, with his report of the way in which the sheep had prospered during his stewardship. He was immediately admitted to the presence of the king. Are you now a successful shepherd? the monarch asked. Yes, indeed, your majesty. In an incomprehensible way, my luck turned, and I can say that nothing has gone wrong, although I still have little taste for raising sheep. Very well, said the king. Yonder is the kingdom of Seville, whose throne is in my gift. Go, and let it be known that I make you king of Seville. And he touched him on the shoulder with the ceremonial axe. The merchant could not restrain himself and burst out. But why did you not make me a king when I first came to you? Were you testing my patience? already stretched almost to breaking point, or was this to teach me something? The king laughed. <laughs> Let us just say that on the day when you took the hundred sheep up the mountain and lost them, had you taken control of the kingdom of Seville, there would not have been one stone standing on top of another there today. THE MAN WITH THE INEXPLICABLE LIFE There was once a man named Mojud. He lived in a town where he had obtained a post as a small official, and it seemed likely that he would end his days as inspector of weights and measures. One day, when he was walking through the gardens of an ancient building near his home, Kidder, the mysterious guide of the Sufis, appeared to him, dressed in shimmering green. Kidder said, Man of bright prospects, leave your work and meet me at the riverside in three days' time. Then he disappeared. Mojud went to his superior in trepidation and said that he had to leave. Everyone in the town soon heard of this, and they said, Poor Mojud, he's gone mad. But as there were many candidates for his job, they soon forgot him. On the appointed day, Mojud met Kira, who said to him, Tear your clothes and throw yourself into the stream. Perhaps someone will save you. Mojud did so, even though he wondered if he were mad. Since he could swim, he did not drown, but drifted a long way before a fisherman hauled him into a boat, saying, Foolish man, the current is strong. What are you trying to do? Mojud said, I do not really know. You're mad, said the fisherman, but I'll take you into my reed hut by the river yonder, and we shall see what can be done for you. When he discovered that Mojud was well spoken, he learned from him how to read and write. In exchange, Mojud was given food and helped the fisherman with his work. After a few months, Kidra again appeared, this time at the foot of Mojud's bed, and said, Get up now and leave this fisherman. You will be provided for. Mojud immediately quit the hut, dressed as a fisherman, and wandered about until he came to a highway. As dawn was breaking, he saw a farmer on a donkey on his way to market. Do you seek work? asked the farmer. Because I need a man to help me to bring back some purchases. Mojud followed him. He worked for the farmer for nearly two years by which time he had learned a great deal about agriculture, but little else. One afternoon, when he was baling wool, Kira appeared to him again and said, Leave that work, walk to the city of Mosul, and use your savings to become a skin merchant. Mojud obeyed. In Mosul, he became known as a skin merchant, never seeing Kira while he plied his trade for three years. He had saved quite a large sum of money and was thinking of buying a house when Kidra appeared and said, 
Give me your money, walk out of this town as far as distant Samarkand, and work for a grocer there. Mojud did so. Presently he began to show undoubted signs of illumination. He healed the sick, served his fellow men in the shop and during his spare time, and his knowledge of the mysteries became deeper and deeper. Clerics, philosophers, and others visited him, and asked, Under whom did you study? It is difficult to say, said Mojud. His disciples asked, How did you start your career? He said, As a small official. And you gave it up to devote yourself to self-mortification? No, I just gave it up. They did not understand him. People approached him to write the story of his life. What have you been in your life? they asked. I jumped into a river, became a fisherman, then walked out of his reed hut in the middle of one night. After that, I became a farmhand. While I was baling wool, I changed and went to Mosul, where I became a skin merchant. I saved some money there, but gave it away. Then I walked to Samarkand, where I worked for a grocer, and this is where I am now. But this inexplicable behavior throws no light upon your strange gifts and wonderful examples, said the biographers. That is so, said Mojud. So the biographers constructed for Mojud a wonderful and exciting history, because all saints must have their story, and the story must be in accordance with the appetite of the listener, not with the realities of the life. And nobody is allowed to speak of Kira directly. That is why this story is not true. It is the representation of a life. This is the real life of one of the greatest Sufis.